Hello and welcome to the last lecture of Understanding Deep Learning lecture series presented by Data SMC. Today we have here Bruno Gavranovic, uh, who is a PhD student at the Mathematically Structured Programming MSP group in Glasgow, advised by Neil Gani. He is understanding machine learning through game theory. Uh, no, he's understanding, sorry, machine learning uh, and game theory through the lens of category theory and functional programming. And before joining MSP, he obtained his bachelor's and master's at the Faculty of Electrical Engineering and Computing in Zagreb. Bruno, thank you for being here today and please take it away. Thank you. Uh, so just to check this, you see, ah, you see the screen, right? Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, really with all these other amazing people that, that gave lots of talks. I'm on, on sort of the deep learning side, but I'm gonna be sort of doing is continuing this this latter the last few talks were about category theory and i'm going to be continuing this approach and really be telling you about some pros i found interesting of learning not just functions using gradient descent but learning something called functors um, so what am i going to be talking about specifically is this correspondence between cycle gan this neural network architecture and categorical database theory now now this sounds very sort of like disjoint, but there is like an interesting way to think about all of this. So, so really why is to, first of all, to understand cycle GAN, to understand like the, the structure of learning that happens in it, but really to transfer also ideas between two different fields. And I'm gonna be doing this by using the language of category theory, which is going to facilitate this conversation between two seemingly disjoint fields. Um, so yeah, it's sort of, something different, uh, what, what I would say. Uh, so what, what, is, what is category theory? Uh, you've seen, maybe you've seen Brendan Fong and, and uh, Joao talk about uh, category theory, and really it's a compositional language for describing systems. It's, it really creates these new abstractions that, lets us, that let us understand the world in, a, I would say, in a simple way and give us systematic way to check abstract claims. I've, I've come, I started sort of with machine learning, then went more into category theory as means to understand machine learning. And, and for me, it's really just, a, it's a good way to organize my thoughts, to write things down, to be explicit in, to say what I mean and mean what I say, and sort of to be less vague and, and less ad hoc. And, uh, but hopefully you're gonna see this from the whole talk. I don't wanna to talk much about what this is. Hopefully you can see. And what I want to say is, uh, this is not something I want to impose. Uh, all I want to say is, to leave you with a quote, is the more clean and consistent your abstractions are, the more it will seem like you were abiding by the laws of category theory. You don't need to know this. You might just reinvent this. So uh, what I'm going to be talking about uh, today is really category theory, but practical experiments. So. Uh, John, John and Brendan were talking about how some, some abstract structure of, of how this works, and I'm going to continue uh, talking about how neural networks work abstractly, but I'm really going to be telling you about a new architecture of neural networks that uh, performs object insertion and deletion with unpaired data in an object invariant way. Uh, uh, and in a way, this is all really very early stage work. I believe the potential of CT is immense. Uh, so, so there's lots of ground to cover today. So I'm gonna, again, you feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. So I'm gonna really be talking, start with CycleGAN, have a slight detour into categorical databases, and then really unpack what CycleGAN, how we can think about it in terms of graphs, free categories, some quotient categories, some equations. And we're gonna really try to understand this new schema, new blueprint of, of, of a network that we can train. Um, uh, so, so that's about it uh, for the start. So I'm just going to go into it because uh, there's, as I said, lots of stuff. So generative modeling, uh, when it comes to images at the very least, uh, the state of the art looks something like this. This is an image of, from the StyleGAN paper where you see really amazing high, high resolution pictures being generated that you know, have to look to see whether they are real or generated. Uh, and it's it's really it's really astonishing. What's so how how it sort of works? Like when you train it, you have this you have this training data, and you've tried you're trying to find this manifold uh, where the real images are, and then sample from it to get like new images that are outside of your training data. 
And some idea is really to think about how can we control this network output? How can we say, well, what's going to be generated outside? Uh, there's many approaches to do that, but essentially there is an issue of us really just needing to sample from a point and not really sample from a distribution, not really knowing what's going to come out. And one way to deal with this, I, I would say, is, is to really use CycleGAN. So, so, so what, what is CycleGAN? Uh, the paper came out a few years ago, and it talks about unpaired image-to-image -image translation using what they're calling cycle-consistent generative adversarial networks. Uh, what, they, what it allows you to do is to take any unpaired group of photos and translate them. So here you see paintings of Monet translated into photographs that look exactly like the scene that was there. Or you see a picture of a zebra translated into a picture of a horse in the exact same surroundings, just with different texture. Same goes for summer to winter photos. Uh, so what you can also do is take a photograph and then learn, the network can learn how Monet paints, how Van Gogh paints, Cezanne, and so on, and translate these photographs into all these different styles. And how it does that is the following. Uh, so usual supervised learning works with, with paired examples. So you have an input and an output pair. And uh, you're, you're learning to minimize some sort of distance between what the network predicts, uh, generates for the input to be the same as the output. But that's quite a bit of constraints on your data set. Often in real life, we might just have a collection of, say, photographs that we took around us and paintings of a particular painter. So we don't really know where this, what photograph this painting corresponds to. Maybe we don't even have it in our data set. But we as humans can look at this stuff, and if we're good at painting, we might be able to translate this style and imagine translating photos back and forth. So how does CycleGAN do this? Uh, we start out with, so I'm gonna be telling you again what CycleGAN is, and then we're gonna understand and unpack it in, in sort of more categorical terms. So here we see two image domains called X and Y. We can imagine them as Paintings, uh, sorry, uh, photographs is, is X and Y could be paintings or winter and summer photos and so on. And the schematic, this is from their paper, what they're saying is, well, how do we do this? We, we, we first learn to translate from photographs to paintings. And we also want to learn a mapping that translates back. So from paintings to photographs. Um, and, you know, we want to learn this network in some way, and uh, how are we going to do this? One thing we want to do when we do this round trip is, well, we want to say if we take a photograph, map it to a painting, and then map it back, uh, we really should end up with the same photograph. Like, there is a loss that we could minimize by doing this round trip, which is dubbed in their paper cycle consistency loss. And likewise, going from uh, paintings to photographs back to paintings, you know that when you do this mapping, what you want to end up with is something that's really as close as possible. So this is another loss that you can minimize. And of course, these are called cycle, but there's also the word GANs. Uh, so there is two discriminators for each, for each uh, of these domains. So there's a discriminator for paintings and there's a discriminator for photographs. Or vice versa, and uh, these, this is a, a second component of what we're learning. So there's lots of stuff here, but the idea is that you start with a graph, then you, which, which you wrote down these two, two maps, you add some sort of cycle consistencies, and you turn this into neural networks and loss functions in a structured way. Now, why am I sort of unpacking this into graph cycle consistencies and stuff, it's because really it's going to be useful later. If we formalize this procedure of how this is done, we can come up with a different graph and then train that. And we're going to see that is something that works. Um, so that's a very quick and bumpy ride uh, when it comes to cycle cans. Now I'm going to shift gears and move into something completely different called categorical database theory. Uh, it's, it's a really big field. I mean, database theory is a big field, and the category theory is trying to express this, 
the stuff that is being done there in sort of universal terms that can be used in other fields. Namely, these are the concepts of categories, functors, and so on. And really the essence of, of what categorical database is, is that you have something called a schema, which is like a blueprint of your database. And then you have a database instance where you, which you fill in this schema with data in a structure preserving way. So here we see two schemas. Uh, it's a graph with vertices and edges in it. So if you look on the left side, we see we have employee, employees, we have departments, we have strings, and each employee works in a department. Um, each department has a secretary who's also an employee. Each employee has a manager and so on. And we know that if we, the, so we can, we can see here what it says that if you look at the department and look at the secretary, well, that secretary and look and go back uh, and check where the secretary works at, that person has to work in the same department. That's what this equation tells us and so on. So there is some stuff here. So I was personally learning about this uh, and it's, it looks pretty interesting. Also might remind you of CycleCAN and this is what you're gonna be talking about. And here's another simple schema where we see beetles and an instrument and we can assign to each beetle an instrument. So far, this is really just a blueprint. There is no data here. And we can fill in these schemas with data. Um, so if you look on the right side, we can, as, so this schema can be mapped. So each beetle can be mapped to George, John, Paul, and Ringo. We can map instruments to bass, drums, and so on. And the map played that assigns an instrument to a beetle, we really can see that to each beetle, we assign, even Ringo, we assign uh, an instrument. Uh, and likewise for this, a um, uh, slightly more complicated schema, we can assign uh, some instance. So this is this is work of, of David Spivak uh, and, and many other people uh, on categorical databases that I'm gonna mention uh, reference for. And the idea is really that we start out with a category which contains the high level information of, of our system and then map it in a structure preserving way into the category of sets. Um, so a functor fills this schema with data and we call this functor, this is called the database instance. Um, <coughs> so we see a very similar picture here. This is a very again, simplified picture, but we start with a graph, we add some equations constraints and turn it into sets in a structured way. So <coughs> we're really gonna be exploring this connection in this talk. And just to give you us, uh, this was a, again, a very short tour of database theory. There is so much stuff that, that is being done here. What can you really do when you formulate stuff uh, categorically? You can, you can do all the stuff that you do usually like migrate data uh, with all these sort of canonical constructions. You can handle constraints, you can do queries. There's really lots of stuff and there's a language being built and uh, it's, it's a whole world of its own. But what I want to really just take from this is, is these two things. So in both CycleGAN and databases, in categorical databases, we have this blueprint, a category, which contains the high level information of what it, is, what it is that we want to do. And we have a structured way of turning it into useful data. So that's a functor for us. Uh, so for databases, we have a functor from C into the category of sets. And, uh, you can always think of these other useful things that you can do, like you can map it into the category of vector spaces or, or something else. There's all these things that, you know, maybe are not used in databases, but category theory allows you sort of to think about it a bit differently. Uh, and one way, one thing you can do is you can map it into the category of parametrized uh, smooth functions, which is uh, what Brendan talked about in the last talk, uh, which is, sort of the corner, the basis of what neural networks, uh, it's the basis of neural networks. Uh, so we're gonna really now look at this in more detail. Uh, when I say this blueprint or a category, um, this can be thought of in many different ways. And there's like, we can add more and more structure to this depending on what it is that we want to do. 
So we can just flat out start with a graph and not impose any equations. Uh, or we can just then say, well, no, some paths should be the same. And then we can add more and more structure. We can sort of say some really high level con constructions uh, in terms of categorical sketches. Uh, this is something I'm not going to be talking about in this talk, but I just want to give you an overview of how this is going to go. Um, so before I go into sort of graphs and, and, and explain how, how, this, how this works, really the rough idea now will be uh, to use this language of category theory, express how we can map all this stuff into parameterized functions, which if you've seen the previous talk, it's really how we can easily compositionally think about neural networks and then see what we're going to get out. And it's something quite, quite interesting. So what follows now is, is sort of a more technical part of the talk where uh, really when I say a graph right now, I'm going to mean, you know, if you're a mathematician, that's going to be a directed multigraph. So between any two points, there could be many arrows and these arrows are going to be directed. So, so something like this. And what we really want to be talking about, what we, really, we want to be talking about when we have sort of a graph, say this cycle GAN that you've seen before. Uh, well, if, if you just have a graph, uh, that's fine, but a convenient way to talk about sort of traversing a path uh, and to make it rigorous is something called a free category on a graph. So starting with a graph, we might want to reason about, well, what are all the possible paths that we can take through it? and have that as data that we can manipulate and, and do something with. Um, and that's called, our, so we're turning a graph into a category and they're really quite related. Um, and I'm gonna just give a concrete example to see how we can think about it. So let's say we start with this graph here. It has two edges, sorry, two vertices and, and uh, two arrows between them. Um, now, when we think of this graph as a category, or when we construct a free category on this graph, we, it's really quite similar, but in category theory, the idea is to be explicit, to sort of say all the things that maybe we wouldn't have otherwise. So when we turn this into a free category, uh, we're gonna get something of the same shape. And the idea is, instead of just having two arrows, uh, we're really going to have many more that arise from just following all the possible paths. So if you take this free category on the graph G, and if you look at the morphisms, I've just written more for morphism here. So it's gonna be like a set of all the morphism in this category. So we're gonna also have, so when we do a free category, we add this secret trivial identity morphisms on each object, which do nothing, but they're important. Sometimes you need to be able to do nothing. Um, we're gonna have the F and G that we had before, but we're also going to have F and then G. So this is a composition of F and G where we go F and G. I'm using this notation, uh, which is sort of called the diagrammatic order. But we're also going to have a map that goes from F to G to F. So really there's an infinite, if infinite uh, number of morphisms here. And if I were to draw them all out, it would be really complicated, which is why we usually draw graphs and just talk about three categories. And what we now ended up with is paths becoming explicit data. Uh, and you know, we can use this really to map, to map from a free category into a neural, into this category of parameterized maps. Uh, we can use this to create neural networks. So starting from the free category on say this, this chosen graph before, we have a functor which creates a neural network architecture. So, so if we unpack what this means, uh, I'll just move this a bit higher up. Uh, Uh, I'll move this higher up. So for instance, the, the object that was named H would get mapped to some Euclidean space. So we can say, for instance, real numbers. And if it's a 64 times 64 image, maybe red, green, blue, or something like this. Now the, the Z object would also get mapped to something like this. Let's say it's going to be the same sort of image space just to make it easier. Um, and now every map every morphism here, G, I guess it was called G, is going to get mapped to a parameterized morphism here. And if you remember, there, there's some details here, what, what a parameterized morphism is, but it's going to be a choice of some parameter space, R to the P, and a map which takes that R to the P 
takes that image 64 and so on and maps it so it's going to map it from here to here uh, and it's also going to take in that parameter space so there's lots of stuff here but the idea is we can map it in a structure preserving way um, there's just a ps here uh, by the way this construction is also used in bayesian networks uh, of of actually it was brendan who did this it, the construction really is quite similar to this. It takes a free category and maps it into some probabilistic categories where you deal with probability. So it's all the same stuff. That's, that's the idea in category theory. You can think about it in, in a unifying language. Um, but the, and, and the idea here is really, we want to create this initial neural network architecture, initialize parameters and iteratively update them. Uh, but the idea is how do we really update them? I didn't tell you what the loss functions are or anything. And this is the idea that we want to identify some of these paths like we do in cycle gap. So we really want to move into, into graphs and, and equations. Um, so there's many ways to talk about this. And again, I'm going to do, give a really sort of bumpy ride here. Feel, please feel free to ask questions or interrupt. Um, uh, it might be, all, it's also okay if, I, I go too fast. I'm sure it took me a long time sort of to understand all these quotient categories. So, but I'll try to do my best really to 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 say how we're thinking about this. Um, I might have to skip quite a bit. So, identifying some paths, sort of in category theory language, you would say where you take you're taking a quotient category, and uh, and thinking of a category that has some sort of generating morphisms, the one that's th that arise from a graph, and then some relations between these morphisms where you say, well, round trip is the same as the nothing or something like this, is, is also called a schema. And um, this arises from the work of, of, of David Spivak uh, in factorial data mi migration that you can look up. So that's that's also called a schema. So, so if you remember our cycle GAN picture from before, it really is the case that cycle consistencies are these equations uh, that they're also often called path equations. And really, you can formalize the blueprint of a cycle GAN using quotient categories. So, so how, how this could be written in category theoretic terms is you would take this free category and sort of quotient it out by some equivalence congruence relation. Um, and in that's just fancy, fancy language for really saying, well, we're going to add some equations that we want to be satisfied to this, to this category. So here we, we see that we have the same graph as before. You know, we can form a free category on it. But then we say, well, actually, we want to say that when you do a G and then you do an F, that is the same as doing identity on H. And really now when we unpack what the morphisms in this quotient of the free category are, we see that really there's not many morphisms. There's just the identity in both of these. When we compose G and F, really, that's just identity. It's not a different morphism. So again, I'm not telling maybe, I'm not saying maybe anything new, or all I am doing is restating the, the, the cycle and paper in, 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 in a different language that happens to be the same language used for categorical data, basically. So one way to sort of think about two neural network models, which I'm calling cycle GAN here in GAN is, is like this, as, as these categories presented with some generators and some relations. So you can think about a GAN even, as something that takes a latent space and maps it to an image. And of course here, I'm for now I'm ignoring discriminators. I'll talk about them towards the end of the talk. Um, uh, and here it's really sort of a bit empty without a discriminator, but for cycle GAN, there is a quite a bit of interesting structure there already, even if you don't add a discriminator. Um, so we're going to be talking about them um, towards the end. And the idea is that each equation that we add can be turned into a into a supervised lo into a loss function essentially. So I, I've skipped quite a bit of stuff, uh, just maybe for the for the essence of time. I want to get to the cool experiments later. But the idea is if you have sort of two paths between two same objects and some equivalents, you can really turn this into some sort of loss function that samples from your data set and computes some sort of distance between them. And I, this is something that you can call a path equivalence or a cyclone consistency loss. <coughs> and we're going to see it doesn't have to be cycles. Uh, 
Um, and again, I've said there's lots of stuff that I skipped, lots of structure you can formalize with functors and the ways they're related with data sets and the ways they're embedded in something. And I'm really not going to be talking about this because I, I sort of want to get the idea across. Um, the, 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 the master thesis I've done was sort of quite a bit oriented onto the category theory. Um, but really, there is lots of lots of stuff that is easily communicable without going into maybe some, some more math. Uh, and I'm not going to now talk about the question of, is there any other blueprint now that, like now that we formalize this, you can say, okay, can I do something else with it? What is this useful for? And I'm going to try to argue the answer is yes, and present a different schema that we can train. So, yes. So this is something that I've been calling a product schema. And actually, this is something... It has a bit more structure. So this is essentially a sketch, a categorical sketch I've mentioned before. But really, we're going to be seeing that it's sort of possible to think of it just as a simple schema. And I'm not going to go into the, to the more and more um, abstract category theory here. Uh, what is it going to do is like CycleGAN sort of maps. CycleGAN is essentially an isomorphism uh, that we're learning. And you can learn it without paired data. Now, a product talks about two objects together. It takes, it puts them together somehow. And if it's a product, you can also remove one object. You can project down. So we're really going to see that we can talk about projecting down, deleting some objects in from images and inserting them into images without any paired data. And really, this is this is object invariant. So the whole schema works no matter if you're trying to remove birds from images or, or glasses from people's faces or something. Uh, so, how does this work? Uh, I'm gonna spend some time on this picture, uh, just to, just to get the idea across. So, there is lots of stuff happening in this picture, but two things you should have in mind is that we have here two data sets, sort of one of just stripes um, that could change their color and one of the circles that could change in their color. And, and we also have a data set uh, of, of circles superimposed. So this is a toy data set. We're going to study this and then expand later to things like style GAN. Um, so we also have a data set of circles superimposed on these stripes. So now we know the following. We know, uh, this is sort of the things that we start with, we know that if we have any sort of pair of images, stripes, and circle, we can do this operation of, of um, superimposing them on one onto the other. Uh, and we also know, sometimes when we start with these things, we can create a data set, but once we superimpose, we also know this other arrow that goes that sort of goes backwards. This is something that we might want to learn. And uh, we know that if you go around trip, uh, this should essentially be the same as the big identity. So the idea is, even though this is a sketch and has more structure, the idea is the same as cycle GAN. We're going to have two objects, and we're going to have a round, round trip that should equal identity. So starting from stripes in a circle, we can go back here, superimpose them, and then go back. And these, these are the maps that we want to learn. And we can train the network to say, well, no, once you go do a round trip, you should end back with what you started, started with. And likewise, um, we want to train that starting from this, we want to decompose it. And then once we do the round trip, we want to end back with what we started. And of course, here we are assuming that, that the network can learn sort of if it, if it has these two images, it can learn to create this and this image. So we're assuming that there is enough information to infer what the behind this, what was behind this circle. And in this simple example, it's sort of obvious that you should just sort of look at the color around and then use that color to use that color to draw the middle bit. So that's the idea of the product task. Uh, and we're going to now look at this in action. So what I did for my, for my test is really is to test this out on three experiments. I started out with the toy data set that you saw and then 
since all of them worked, like scale it up to, to something more complex. So the stripes and circles data set, as I've said, we have sort of things like this, and we know we can decompose them into just the stripes or into just the circles. And uh, I've I'm sort of skipping a lot of detail right now, by the way. This is maybe what I, what I should mention is uh, this, the same learning procedure here is now as in the cycle GAN. There is the cycle consistency loss that we're minimizing, even though there is some other stuff. This is why it's a sketch, but we can think of it as a schema. And we're going to have these two data sets that are unpaired of stripes and circles. And from this unpaired data set, the network is going to learn. Now, if you read the paper, uh, there's details about what network we use, but there is no tricks here. It's just the simplest con net uh, with just some layers. It really uh, it doesn't seem to be that important. Um, yeah. Or you can ask me about this later. So what I'm really going to be talking about is the, the result of this evaluation right now here. So 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 what I did what I did here is is I tried so I took a stripe I fixed a stripe color and I fixed a circle and so within the network combined them into a composite thing, and uh, and then I tried changing the color of the circle to see sort of what the generalization power of this is. Did it really learn any sort of meaningful way of or did it just somehow remember? And for these small data sets, you see that it actually does learn. It takes a stripe and a circle and manages to superimpose it. That's sort of pretty easy. And you see it adds some noise on it of some way, or it sometimes just changes the color a bit. But it sort of works for this simple data set. Now, another thing you can do is you can really test this and play out, play with this. So, so you can uh, keep the circle color fixed and change the stripes. And you, for some reason, this I think, no, there's another experiment that's not going to work as well, but this one also seems to work okay. Uh, now, the tough bit is to decompose it. If you start with a, with a, uh, if you start with stripes and circles superimposed, you can try to teach the network to decompose this into two constituents. And sometimes it just fails in ways I did not know why, but the idea is, uh, in most of the cases, it does manage to learn and decompose this. So since this worked, the idea was, well, can we scale this up? Can I use maybe like the, the famous Celebay data set and see whether this works? So the, this is a data set of, it's a, it's a famous data set of 2000K images of human faces, um, each of which come with some annotations. So eyeglasses, bangs, pointy nose, all the face and so on. So I just used the glasses annotation and separated out a data set into people with glasses and people without. Now, instead of using a picture of glasses, I just tried teaching the network to decompose this into like a latent vector. So this would be like a thing that would be embedded into a GAN, basically, uh, that wouldn't have any visual uh, representation. But as you change these vectors and keep the image fixed, you would expect that the glasses change here. And we're gonna see how that worked in practice. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty cool, it sort of works. Uh, I wouldn't say it works flawlessly, but I think it sort of proves that the idea has some merit at the very least. So on the left side here, you see we see a person, and on each row, we try I tried a different latent vector uh, on a trained neural network. And so hopefully these vectors should all add the same type of glasses, these vectors should all type the same type of glasses, these ones should as well. And while there is some variance, it really didn't learn how to uh, properly disentangle these factors of variation, but it did learn to add glasses on this guy, which is pretty cool. Uh, and likewise, you can have a person with glasses, you can try to decompose it into a person with, without glasses and a latent vector, and then you can change that vector and have that person have the different glasses on. And um, you get results like this. And I do have to say, these are the, some of the cool looking samples. M many samples did not work that's always a good caveat, caveat to say, but many of them did, and, and that's that's something I did. Um, so what you can also do is just try to remove glasses from people, and sometimes that would just fail because of how neural networks are, I guess. And you see, it tends to blur the image quite a bit. Uh, so that's, that's also an issue. Uh, and there, there's a bunch of experiments you can do. Uh, so, yeah, I think I've done the same experiment here. I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip skip this for now and really go on maybe to the 
to, to just another way of, of validating this. It, this took like a long time to train and uh, it was a hassle. So, so what I did is really use the pre-trained style GAN sort of to create a data set of latent vectors to see if I can do some cool stuff with, um, with a pre-trained network that generates these high level, high resolution images, but really manipulate the, the latent space that it has. So, so what I did was just uh, download style GAN, take the trained network, create a bunch of, just sample randomly, uh, and create and see what the images are. And then based on what the images are, I made like a small program that creates, oh, if it's a person with glasses, it saves into one file, it saves the vector into one file. If it's a person without glasses, it's another file. And then when you write this in just 10 minutes, you can say yes or no, or skip the image if it looks bad and create this data set of people with glasses and people without. And then you can do the same thing here, except now you don't have to really train it. It just works. And you have to rely on style GAN actually disentangling these factors of variation and having a sensible latent space, uh, which we're going to see right now. So, so what you can do is you can start with a person with glasses and uh, try removing them. So you would decompose the, the person with glasses into an image and a latent vector. And again, these are some of the best samples. It would most of the time work, and you can really look at the paper for that. Um, but the idea is really without knowing what the latent vectors even were, uh, this thing ended up working. So so, um, so you can see it, it learns to remove glasses from people, but it also slightly changes them. Uh, like it has the different earrings here or just a completely different picture here, or there's a goatee added. Uh, so you can, I, I just did a lot of fun stuff like adding glasses on people and you see it didn't really work properly. It would always, so this would be the images and each row would add a different glass vector, um, glasses vector. And most of the time it really changed the gender. So it's a mystery really why, <laughs> why this works the way it does. Uh, but yeah, I, there's, there's a fun experiments you can do here. Uh, you can take a, per so there's ex explanation in the paper, but uh, the top row is the original image and then you remove the glasses and then you try adding different types of glasses in each row and you can play around with this. And this is whole, just the whole idea is to show that, uh, the, whole, the whole idea is to show really that there's another schema that you can do and, and play around with, uh, which is sort of directly inspired by, by, by these categorical databases. It was, once you do cycle GAN, you can really start asking, well, what, what else can we do? Uh, so, so this was a, again, a very bumpy ride of, of, of some of the things that happen are happening with, with, with category theory and machine learning. And we, we're doing quite a bit of work right now and really sort of showing that it's a good framework to, for thinking about neural networks, for connecting them to a lot of work that's happening in like really modern mathematics or, or programming language theory. And it's really a pedagogical tool as well. It's, it's, it, it at least helped me understand stuff. So yeah, in, in conclusions, we, there's like a bridge you can make and really devise a new schema, do, delete objects and insert them without their data and do some testing in practice. So future work for this is really to think about, so I told you this is without the, the theory that, that here is presented is without any discriminators. But of course, in practice, you just you have, you have to use them. So, so the theory is really now missing the discriminators and there's reasons why, why some things aren't clear how they work. But that's part of the future work, and I'm really happy to, if somebody has any ideas or, or, or questions, really about other discriminators, other schemas you can do. So recently, there has been some progress in maybe framing supervised learning. So you have an input and an output, and you can frame supervised learning as you learn a map, and there's a ground truth, and you have an equation. GANs have their own equation. Cycle GAN, if you had the extra discriminators, would have their own. You can also formalize autoencoders, which are, and this is what they say in the CycleGAN paper. CycleGAN is like an autoencoder uh, with extra added discriminators. So, so it's, it's all pretty interesting. It, it gives you a new and interesting perspective to think about. Um, and really future work is really to connect this to some of the more recent work on category theory and neural networks, some of the stuff that Brendan mentioned, where really we found out that neural networks, loss functions, and optimizers are all the same kind of structure. 
they are all parameterized lenses. And I have an animation here that sort of uh, just shows roughly how the flow of information works there. I'm not going to go into this now, but there is this uh, forward and backward flow and parameters are coming from the top and there's a whole formal graphical language for this. And there, there's lots of stuff. So, so I think this is where, where, I, where I'm going to end and, and um, ask if there is any questions. Amazing lecture. Uh, we have some questions here. Uh, the first one is uh, how this idea of uh, graph and category theory can relate to transfer learning? That's a good question. So uh, I can hypothesize widely. So in, in, in database theory, you have something. So when you have a few schemas, so you might have a schema and you might map it to say a category of sets and you might have a functor from another schema into this. So I'm just not looking at the details of these schemas. So once you do this, you can transfer sort of, you can transfer the data that goes here into set and make it go from sort of from this schema into set. And you can transfer data in a structure preserving way. So, so, so one avenue to explore is really to, to look at these data migration functors and, and, and functors between these categories as sort of functors transferring data from one learning setting into a, maybe a bigger learning setting or one with more constraints. That would be one one way, I guess. But I really haven't thought about this. this yet. <laughs> nice. Uh, th there's another question. Uh, do you have any good references to start learning uh, about specifically uh, category theory and neural networks uh, used together? <laughs> right. So. I, I've personally been doing a lot of work uh, on this. So I'm biased in saying like some of our papers make, I, I would say even quite pedagogical uh, progress in really under, in explaining what this is. So uh, I could probably post a link to, to my website with some of the papers and I would really uh, maybe urge to see, to see some of the live talks where on the papers you don't see the animations, but I've done some recent live talks with animations like this, where we re where I really try to expand on how we can think about sort of composing these morphisms or some of the higher categorical structures in a, in a visual way. Um, so that's that's it. And of course, the, this is all this all started with the work of, of Brendan Fong, Spivak, and Remy Tuyeras of this backpropas functor that was that was shown before. So that's a good resource. And anything that that these papers cite, um, we recently had a paper on category theory and machine learning which is oriented for maybe category theorists, but it's also a way of, uh, it just uh, does a, it's a survey paper which talks about many of the things that happen. So that might be a thing to check out. Or at the very least, you can also always send me an email and maybe with a specific thing, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, there, there's another question. Uh, how can uh, category theory help to develop new architectures? So, I would say one way is the one I presented. And really it's, it's, it's a, like the way I'm thinking of about category theory, it helps us understand what is already there. Often you spend a lot of time really just distilling, not making new stuff, just distilling, saying things that were already existing in a different way, looking at them from a different perspective. So this different perspective is sometimes useful, but there's not like a clear cut way of, oh, this is how you're gonna create a new, <laughs> new way. Okay, uh, last question. Uh, can we relate, uh, can we relate uh, disentangled representations uh, with the results uh, presented uh, by you in the uh, last images? I think he I, refers uh, to the uh, glasses. Uh, yeah, yeah, I certainly hope so. Uh, I really don't know. Uh, <laughs> that, that, I think that's all I have to say. Um, I haven't, it, it does feel like disentangling some, some factors of variation, something, some representations, uh, but I'm really not familiar with the, the sort of the more, the newer work that's been done in this area. Okay, okay. Uh, that's it for today. Uh, thank you, Bruno, for the amazing lecture. And thank you so much, it's, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> okay, uh, well, this is the last lecture in this uh, Understanding Deep Learning lecture series. There will be a panel uh, and we will finish 
this amazing uh, uh, lecture series. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Bruno, once again. And see you next time. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye.